Good morning, I'm on. You better get me on. Here we are. Good morning. How is everyone today? Hey, let me tell you, you may be happy to be in church this morning, but I don't know if you're as happy as I am. <laughs> Praise the Lord for your prayers. Thank you so much for your prayers for uh, the Simpsons. Uh, we've been out of church for nearly three weeks, and uh, boy, that just, you can't abide that when you're a preacher. And so it's, uh, uh, we're very blessed to be here. I wasn't sure it was going to happen. Brother Lester had one in the hole. Um, our circumstances kind of dictated, seemed like dictated that we were going to have to get tested today. Today is 10 days since our last test. And so this morning we were up at the testing facility at too early in the morning and, uh, to get our brains tickled and, um, negative. Praise the Lord. Amen. And so we're glad to be here. Thank you. Hey, Nathan, Nathan, I didn't ask you, is it okay if I share your news you shared with me yesterday? Y'all been praying for Nathan. Uh, Nathan is, uh, had surgery about six weeks ago, five, maybe four or five weeks ago, maybe now that I think of it. Um, had a major surgery on his uh, intestines, and, um, and that was a very successful surgery, and y'all probably know a good bit about that. But there was still one little question about uh, whether or not he still had maybe a version of colitis or Crohn's disease, and yesterday, he, uh, the earlier this, or later this week, he got a call from his doctor and uh, confirmed that they don't believe he has Crohn's. So, praise the Lord, amen. Um, again, thank you for praying for us. Continue to pray for Melissa. She's here, but she's still not feeling 100%, and so she's, but 85% of Melissa is like 1,000% Darren, so, um, so thank you for praying for us. Continue to pray for her. Um, thank you, Brother Lester, for filling in. Uh, I was trying not to ring him out too much. He's going to go uh, fishing in a whip, about a week here. And so, um, so hopefully he'll get rested up where he can do that. Um, two more announcements. I want to have a VBS meeting. Anybody who has volunteered or has any interest or any have kids or whatever related to VBS, this afternoon we're going to have a meeting immediately after the morning service right down here. Uh, up here by the piano, and uh, if y'all could meet everybody who has anything to do with VBS, it could it'll probably be a very short meeting, okay? Um, so don't forget to do that. And then this afternoon, we have missionary. And uh, uh, while the Simpsons were holed up, stuck in their stinking house for three weeks, the uh, there was a missions conference in Garland, Texas, and, and the Hudson's got to go, and, and uh, Brother Lester was and he scheduled a missionary on my leave a protege or, or uh, a spiritual descendant of for us prepare your heart to hear his prepare to hear the preaching of his word, of the word from, uh, uh, from this man, and then prepare, if God leads you, to give and support this man. Uh, we may look at him. We have an opening uh, for a, a, to add a missionary to our uh, supporting ranks, and, uh, uh, and we're going to be praying about that. But today is still an opportunity to support this man and give him a good offering. And so uh, pray about how you might do that. Amen? Let's worship. Let's stand together. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up prayer, and Brother Eric is going to lead us. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you that we're here. Lord, thank you for our health. Thank you for um, uh, our liberty and our freedom to do this openly um, with all the, uh, and all the resources you give us to, to do this and to do it as well as we can. I pray you bless this service. Bless our worship today. I pray it will be a sweet-smelling savor to you. Lord, I pray you be with me as I preach. Lord, I'm all charged up and tired at the same time, but God, you're the Holy, you're a God, and, and uh, I just want to be your vessel today. In Christ's name I pray, amen. We're going to begin with, I will sing the wondrous story, 508 if you're using him. I will 
will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. How he left his home in glory for the cross of Calvary. Yes, I'll sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. Sing it with the saints in glory gathered by the crystal sea. I was lost, but Jesus found me, found the sheep that went astray. Through his loving arms around me, drew me back into his way. Yes, I'll sing a wondrous story. <coughs> <coughs> Sing it with the saints in glory Gathered by the crystal sea Amen. We're going to continue our worship singing the heart of worship. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless you. much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord remain standing. I'm going to read my text for this morning. I'm not going to preach every single one of these verses, but I'm going to read all of them to you. So uh, let's read from John chapter 14. Jesus says to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whither I go, you know, and the way you know. And Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how could we know the way? And Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth you know him and have seen him. And Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I, shall, I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will, will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that, you may, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, but it seeth him not. Because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet in a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that uh, hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Judas saith unto him, not to scare it, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world? And Jesus said, and answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him, and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard now, uh, you have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you loved me, you would rejoice, because I said I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the comforter and for your comfort and your love. Lord, thank you for how you show up and show off in our life. And, and, and God, I just pray as we continue in our worship that our minds will be drawn to focusing on you, focusing on your provision in our life, focusing on how you provided a Savior and eternal salvation for us through him. Lord, I pray you just help us to feel blessed today, comforted and encouraged. Lord, I pray for this offering we're about to receive, and, and I pray you just help us to uh, give freely, trusting in you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.
right, well, let's all stand. We're going to continue our, uh, what did I do here? Sorry. The number is 530, and I'd turn to 350. I just couldn't get that to work. So we're singing Saved, Saved. I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to tell how he lived. the computer is going to have a day. Don't let that distract you from worship. Amen. We're going to continue. We're going to finish our worship with number 505, Love Lifted Me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deep stained within sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me now safe am i love lifted me love lifted me when nothing else could help love lifted me This hand still leads 
me as I go I'm trusting to the unseen hand that guides me through this weary land and some sweet day His hand has led through shadows drear And while it leads, I have no fear I know it will lead me to that home Where sin nor sorrow e'er can come I'm trusting to the unseen guides me through this weary land and some sweet day I reach that strand still guided by the unseen Savior's face and sing the story saved by grace and there upon that golden strand I'll praise him for his guiding hand I'm trusting to the unseen hand that guides me through this weary land and some sweet day I reach that strand still guided by the unseen hand Thank you, Bob. Perfect song selection. Very good. Thank you. Uh, if you would open your Bibles to John chapter 14. I read this text earlier, and uh, it will be where we spend most of our time this morning. Let me share with you that the last almost three weeks did not quite go according to my plans. Or to Melissa's plans, or to my boys' plans. We had plans to be at a birthday party, and I'm sure they wanted to swim every day, although they didn't bring it up one time. Praise the Lord. So I always have to tell them no if you're stuck in COVID. Um, but, you know, being home and isolated and unable to really do what I want to do and be where I want to be and us for us to, you know, engage in ministry, what God has called us to do was... Frankly, it was frustrating. It's really frustrating. And, um, and it makes us easy for us to lose sight of what is important and what, what, is, uh, what is valuable, where we can find real comfort. And it's, you know, we, we're constantly beings, and especially in our culture, looking for comfort, aren't we? We're looking for comfort, we're looking for security, we're looking for meaning and purpose in our life. And fulfillment. Once I got on my knees to talk to God about all this, it seemed obvious where I should look for comfort. You know, it reminds me actually of a, a story. There's a story of Sherlock Holmes. You remember when Sherlock Holmes went camping with Dr. Watson? Do you remember that? It's not in the book. It's okay. You know, Holmes, uh, Holmes took... Uh, Dr. Watson, they went on a camping trip together, and in the middle of the night, Holmes uh, wakes Dr. Watson up, and he says to him, Watson look, Watson, look up and tell me what you see. You know, Watson was always trying to, you know, kind of 
keep up with Sherlock. And so in this opportunity, he says, well, I, I see millions and millions of stars. And Holmes says, well, what does that tell you? Watson thinks for a moment. He responds, well, astronomically, it tells me that there are millions of galaxies and possibly billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in the position of Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorology, meteorology, uh, uh, boy, man, that's a, that's a big one. Meteorologically, I suspect that we have a beautiful day tomorrow. Why, Sherlock? What does it tell you? Holmes was quiet for a second, and then he said, Someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> There's times when we miss the obvious, isn't there? When what we need is right in front of our eyes. And if we would just open them, if we would just calm down, quit looking around us everywhere else, we might find exactly what we need. As we read this text earlier, I hope to noted that Jesus was answering some pretty big questions in this chapter, uh, John chapter 14. I mean, look at John 14, 5. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? And Thomas is concerned about the way, of, uh, he, that the way might be unknown to, to Jesus' disciples, that they might not be able to find Jesus uh, after he leaves them. Then Jesus gave answer to Philip's statement in John 14, 9 through 11. He says, it says, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Well, there's a whole sermon in these two, two or three verses, by the way. He that, sa- he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Thomas was confused, and Philip was confused, and, and they needed Answers, they needed truth, they needed security, they needed, uh, they needed comfort. Then Judas, not Iscariot, asked a question in verse 22 and through 24. Judas saying to him, uh, Lord, how is it that thou will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus said and answered to him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my, love, and my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Those are sweet words, let me tell you. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father which hath sent me. Listen, there's so much wrapped up in these questions. And, and in this chapter that I'm going to tell you right now, I am not equal to the task of unpacking all of it this morning for you before lunch. Okay, If I was going to try to do it all, boy, I could do it. But we would be here a lot longer than after lunch. But what I want you to see today, that Jesus here with his disciples, he's sincerely trying to reveal to them truths, truths that should comfort them throughout the long and difficult life that they're going to live as true followers of Christ. He wants to give them comfort. My sermon title this morning is Comfort for Our Every Day. Comfort for today. Jesus wanted his disciples to have exactly what they needed. He wanted them to have what everybody needs and searches for. Comfort, satisfaction, fulfillment, security. Let me tell you this morning, as clearly as I can, that Jesus is all that you need. Jesus is all that you need. He's all that you need in this life right now and in the life to come. He's all that you need. So look at me this morning. Look with me, excuse me, at three important truths that are of inexpressible comfort in John chapter 14. The first one is that there's a house that Jesus talks about. 
Remember what Jesus said? He told his disciples, let not your heart be troubled, for he was going to prepare a place for them. Let not your heart be troubled. He's going to prepare a place for them. We know that one day we're going to leave this world, aren't we? All of us. The Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. Every single person in this room, from the oldest to the very youngest, will die one day. You know, nearly eight years ago, Melissa and I bought a uh, 2011 Mazda CX-9. Man, it was a wing dinging car for the time. It was four years old when we bought it, and now it is getting up on up in age. We've put 155,000 miles on it. It's been a great car. We took it on a long road trip. Right now it has a dead battery. But that's okay. That's all right. Not a big deal. That happens, right? But a few times Mazda has sent us letters, and sometimes they've been pretty pressing and annoying about it, recalling our car, right? Recalling our car. Say, hey, you've got to bring this thing back. There's something wrong with it. It's time to bring it back home, and we've got to we gotta fix it. You know, there's even been recalls on cars entirely where people have had the cars that they've purchased, they've had to give back to the maker completely. I had to get something else or get paid back for the cost of their vehicle. Well, listen. Listen, when you're driving your car, uh, uh, the car you're driving is not the only thing that can be re- recalled by the maker. <laughs> right? This life is going to come to an end for each of us at some point. One day, we're going to be called to meet with God. And for those of us who have trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior, there's a home prepared for us. There's a home. This place for you. Jesus said it was a place prepared for you. I mean, he's talking to his disciples here, but who else are counted among his disciples? All who trust and follow Christ. Amen? We've been preaching and talking about this whole year, about what it means to be a true disciple. If you're a true disciple, there's a place he has prepared for you. It's a very personal thing that God has done for his children. This this makes this place prepared for us. It's it's going to be a comfortable, comfortable and a peaceful place. You know, I was thinking about how to illustrate this a little bit and I realize that it's been about two years, we're about two years in our relationship with the Simpsons and Northwest Baptist Church. About two years. In fact, it was two years ago at the missions conference, Brother Lester and I sat down in, his, uh, in, in their suite and we talked about ministry and maybe me coming and preaching in view of a call here. And I remember vividly that very first meeting. I don't remember what I preached about and I probably would like to forget it, but... I remember when you meet someone new and you're kind of in a new place, a new family, and that's what churches end up becoming to each other, right? You're in a new family. It's kind of awkward a little bit, right? Y'all don't know me, and I didn't know you guys. And, but as we, when we came back the second time, y'all knew me a little better. And y'all had learned some things about me that y'all remembered. And y'all prepared some snacks for us. And you remembered what my kids enjoyed. And y'all bought them gifts and and what you were doing in your wonderful hospitality that we hope I will y'all will never lose is y'all were preparing a place for us a place of comfort you were trying to make us feel at home let me tell you god is preparing a place for you and a home that is unlike any other home you've ever experienced And when we die, we will truly be at home with Christ. Think about, that we're talking about the place that he's preparing for you. What about the preparer of this place? Who, who is preparing this place again? It's Jesus. He, he didn't say that the angels were preparing a place for us, but that he was going to prepare a place for us. Think of that. Just think about that. Who is personally preparing a place for you? Jesus is. Yeah, isn't, it, isn't it a little bit beyond your comprehension that the Lord of glory would personally prepare for you a home in heaven? Uh, my imagination, I have a 
Vivid imagination, my boy is Ben, especially, comes by it naturally. If you ever spend much time around Ben, he's got a wild imagination. But you know, as soon as I learned and connected the dots that Jesus was going to prepare a place for you and in my father's house are many mansions, you know what I thought of? Jesus was a carpenter. He knows how to prepare a good place. And he's doing that personally for us. I don't know if he's got heavenly hammers and nails, but he's doing it personally for you. The one who built the universe is preparing a place for you and for me. And there's one piece to this this home that he's preparing that's even greater than having this eternal place to live. And that's no, and knowing that Jesus has prepared it. Jesus is preparing this place as a perfect place to, to be in quarantine. Praise the Lord. Amen. If, y'all have spent, if any of y'all have spent any time in quarantine, that much time alone will drive you bonkers. And Jesus isn't preparing this place for you to be in quarantine alone for eternity. No. Jesus, uh, Jesus is preparing this place so that he can be with us. He said, and I go and prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I mean, how do we even take all that in? That, especially with the thought that we're going to be the very company of our Redeemer, of our Savior, of the, of the God of the universe. Who in Colossians it says he by him all through all him through him all things consist. Everything is held together by Jesus. This incredibly important individual, the one who stands alone in all of history and all of creation, above creation, beyond creation, is going to be with us. He's personally made a place for us. That's the first. Uh, uh, important truth. The second, think about the second part of this passage would be the way to this home. You know, Thomas had that concern uh, from the moment Jesus began to talk about going away. Remember, Jesus said, uh, let your hearts not be troubled. He's trying to give them comfort. He says, I'm going to leave and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And, and Thomas, he had this concern. His concern centered on the way to the home Jesus was promising to him. How are we going to find you, Jesus? And, and it makes sense why Thomas would feel this way, why he would think this way. I mean, after all, if you lost your way trying to find uh, the place that Jesus promised, you would have no hope of ever finding it on your own, would you? And Jesus spoke very specifically when he said, I am the way. He's, telling, he's answering this question, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, let's, let's take a little bit and just kind of an, unpack some truths buried in this statement. He said, he is the way. And he said that, he said he is the way so that you could be saved. Listen, despite what many believe, Jesus wasn't just a great teacher sent to show us some way and to show us some truths and to give us some life. No, Jesus is the only way that anyone can be saved from the judgment of sin. He is the way. There's not two ways. There's not three ways. There's not a thousand ways to, uh, to the home God promises. Jesus is the only way to heaven. We read in Acts 4.12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Listen, in today's humanistic society with little knowledge or understanding of what true Christian faith is, this world believes that the diversity of religionism in America is due to the fact that all religions lead to the same place. They say, oh yeah, we're just trying to get to the top of the mountain, but there's many ways to get up there. There's a great difference from this and those who are true biblical Christians, and that lies in the difference Uh, And the fact that we serve a risen, living Savior. Let no one ever tell you that all religions are the same. Let me tell you, there is no other world religion. I got books on my shelf in my office 
I got at least half a dozen of them that are about other world religions, and none of them have a risen, living Savior. Not one of them. And that makes all the difference. That Jesus died and rose again, he didn't teach, he didn't just teach a better way of living that, w- that one might be able to uh, enable us to be accepted by the Father. No, he is the way to the Father. He didn't say, hey, uh, obey these truths and obey these and kind of try to do your best and then you'll make it. No, he said, I'm the way. You come to me and I'll take you to him. He alone can save us from our sin and grant us this risen life that he displayed at his empty tomb. He's the truth. He said he's the way. He is the way so that we can be saved. And he is the truth so that we can be sure. You want to talk about a need for comfort. How would you like to not know you're going to heaven or hell? How unsure... Think. Think about that, how, how unsteady that is when you think about the ramifications of eternity. And there's a world of people around us who live this every day and are searching. They're looking for comfort. They're looking for the comforter. They're not looking in the right place. Jesus said he is the truth, and he, he is the truth so that we can be sure One thing that Jesus desired for his disciples was assurance. He was not ambiguous. He didn't use vague language about uh, himself or about assurance. He was clear and straightforward concerning the assurance that we can have in him. He says, I am the way. There's nothing ambiguous about that. There's no maybe or might or could be in there. It's am. He is. There's certainty. He said, no one comes to the Father but by me. There are those who don't really like the exclusivity of Jesus. There's many. Uh, Again, we live in a world full of people who hate the idea that that Christians believe that Jesus is the only way. And they believe that we want to just pound them with that and oppress them. But what, what Jesus wants us to do is to share them the truth that they might be liberated and have freedom in Christ and salvation for all eternity. And so, while there's many who may hate the exclusivity of Jesus, those of us who know him as our Savior should love it. Because we can be absolutely sure. Oh, man. He is the way. He is the truth so that you can be sure. And he is the life so that you can have strength when you need it. Listen, true Christians have strength that is not their own. Jesus is their life. Listen to what Paul said in Galatians 2.20, one of my favorite verses in all of Scripture. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I, uh, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Listen, Paul is stating clearly that Christ was his life. Christ lived in Paul. We don't, let me tell you, I don't hold on to my, I'm not in charge of holding on to my salvation. I don't have the strength to do it. I know I don't. I fail, man, daily, by the hour sometimes. I'm not responsible to hold my salvation Jesus, though, he holds us in our salvation. The writer uh, to the Hebrews wrote these words in chapter 6, verse 19. He said, Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within, uh, within the veil. So what hope is he talking about? The hope, this living hope in our lives. Paul spoke of this living hope in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. He said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and 
that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed, uh, to be revealed in the last time. Who ever thought that Peter could have written so well? Listen, he is the life that gives us strength. He's the strength that we can rely on. It's his power. It's through his power that we live and that we can live the life he's called us to live. Let's consider one more important thing this morning that is so important to us as Christians. Remember, we are, we're looking at all we need. and We have already seen the home prepared for us and the way that Jesus uh, the way that we are to take, which is through Jesus. Think about this. Think about we have the house, we have the home, the way to the home, and the helper on the way to the home. Jesus promised us that until we're called to the home he is preparing, we're going to have a helper every day here on earth. Who is this helper? Well, Jesus spoke of this helper as a person and he, he, we read, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Listen, you, you, you see in the words of Jesus that he speaks of a comforter, of the comforter, the Holy Spirit, as him, this presence of God with us is the person of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, the Trinity is made up of the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Uh, Yet yeah, we do not worship three gods. No, we worship one true God. And the person of God indwells in every true believer. And he guides us in truth. He'll prompt us to serve him. He'll comfort us through trials. He'll lead us in decisions. And he does even more than that. We're not alone in this world. Jesus wanted his disciples to know this. For in this world, he reminded them that they were going to face difficult times. They were going to face tribulation, and they were going to face trials. So he said, I'm sending you a comforter. What's the purpose of this helper? We talked a little bit about this. One of his purposes is to guide us into all truth. There's a story about four men on a, on a plane that was running out of gas. Four men on this airplane. Airplanes are running out of gas. Bad situation. There was a pilot, a student, a minister and the smartest man in the world were on this plane. And yet they only had three parachutes. It came down to the student and the minister as to which one would remain on the plane and probably die. And the minister graciously told the student that, that he could jump and take the parachute and that he would die. He'd go down with the plane and die. The student said, Preacher, don't worry about that. You come with me. The smartest man in the world just jumped out of the plane with my backpack. <laughs> well, so you might look and, and think of yourself as the smartest person in the room or in the world, but without God's guidance, without God's influence on our decisions, all the intelligence that you can you can bring to yourself is absolute foolishness. The Spirit will guide us into even deeper knowledge of, of the Lord. I heard a, another story about four soldiers uh, during a war. and they, they wandered away into the desert and they got disoriented and lost. And they came upon a general who was checking out uh, an area for future troop placement. And the soldiers ran up to him and said, Do you know where we are? They're asking for help. They're lost. And the general was so angry. He was angry because they didn't salute him or call him sir or, or show him any deference at all. He said, do you even know who I am? And one of the soldiers said to the others, great, we don't know where we are and he doesn't know who he is. 
tell you, the Holy Spirit can teach us all we need to know about who we are, about who God is, and about who Jesus was, and what he did for us, and what he's doing for us right now. He can tell us what we need to be doing to follow him faithfully. And this helper, he's not going anywhere, is he? Verses 18 through 20, Jesus told his disciples that he's, he was going to leave them, but he reminded them yet again that the helper would never leave them. They're not going to be left on the earth as spiritual orphans. They were going to have God with them. The Holy Spirit is God's permanent presence with his people. And he'll be with us until God takes us home. Amen. And I, I'm getting close to need to be done here, but let me add just one more thought. Verse 27 of chapter four, John 14. If you have your Bibles open, read these words with me. Verse 27. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth. Not any kind of peace that you can find in this world. Not any kind of hope or, or satisfaction or fulfillment that you can find in this world. He said, it's my peace that I'm going to leave with you. And you can't find it anywhere else. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Jesus was letting the disciples know that the peace of God was going to go with them. Even after he'd gone away. And there's... There's really so much we could say about the peace of God. I could take you to Philippians, one of my favorite passages, chapter 4, and talk about how the peace of God will guard our hearts. There's so much to say, but, but Jesus, the point is that Jesus doesn't want to live in anxiety in this world. That's such a huge, isn't that such a huge and growing problem in our society? is anxiety and fear and, and, and all these emotional difficulties. I mean, I, I know if I did a little bit of research in preparation for this, I could have told you lots of statistics about how the increase in anxiety over the last 20 years has probably skyrocketed. Seems like it's part of more conversation than I, uh, than I could ever remember before then. Jesus doesn't want us to live in anxiety in this world he wants us to know that he's with us and that he's not leaving us. He's here to grant us peace, peace beyond our understanding. We have the peace of God and the God of peace with us through the presence of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I don't, I don't know what brought you here this morning. You might have come out of habit like most of us. This is where you're supposed to be on Sunday. You're not supposed to be anywhere else. And when you're not here, let me tell you, there's anxiety. I could speak directly to that. But I guarantee that all of you, just like everybody else in this world, are seeking comfort, are, are looking for purpose and meaning, looking for security, comfort. Where are you looking? This chapter, this time that Jesus spent with his, with his disciples, at one of the most tumultuous, right on the precipice of one of the most tumultuous times in their lives. And Jesus wanted to give them what? Comfort. Comfort not just for the few days or weeks ahead, but for every day of their life. Comfort for their every day. You may be here this morning and you may not know Christ personally. You may not have ever trusted Him. You might know a lot of things. And if you have access to the internet, you might think you know even more than what you really know. But if you don't know Christ, you don't know what you need to know. You don't have what you need to have. Yet if you have Christ, you could be missing lots of worldly goods and comforts and intelligence and knowledge but you can be assured you have everything you need. 
If you know Christ, let me remind you again that Jesus is all that you need. This morning, we had a, if you were here for Sunday school, we had a wonderful lesson from the life of Moses about how Moses came to be, entered into this world under the circumstances of a government that wanted to see him killed upon birth. And his parents, who had no hope, had no hope of keeping their son, keeping their son against the will of the Pharaoh, of their ruler. They looked to God, and they found in him all that they needed. All that they needed. They looked to God, and he delivered Moses right into their hands <laughs> and paid him to, do it, to take care of him. Listen, if you're here today and you're struggling, like I have the last couple weeks, look to Jesus. Boy, he loves you. I love every one of you. He loves you way more than I even could. And he cares about you. And he wants to comfort you. Let's stand together. Brother Eric's going to come. Miss Glenda is going to play.